Yeah, thank you. Be seated. Yes, it's interesting that we're going to be talking about a storm today. <laughs> See how that works? That just beautiful <laughs> little combo there. Yeah, I tell you, man, the storms of life, the issues, the crisis of life are just at times devastating, overwhelming. They come quickly. They're, uh, they're drastic and, and, and tough. And when the crisis of life hit, we generally respond in similar ways. And, and of course, they're usually just the exact opposite of how we need to respond in order to be able to deal with these things in life. Because if, you're, uh, if, you're, if you still have a pulse like we've done the last few weeks, you know, hey, Phil over there, if there's a pulse, uh, you're going you're gonna to have some crisis in life. We've been dealing with how to handle life hurts uh, kind of as a thought about uh, what we're doing over the four, four or five messages here. We dealt with rejection and we're encouraged by Jesus to shake the dust off our feet and move on, uh, that all of us are going to be rejected in life, that uh, it's inevitable that we be, uh, whether it's a friend or a family member or whether it's a mate or whoever it might be, we're going we're gonna to suffer rejection in life, and it's one of those painful things that uh, Jesus just encourages us to uh, move past and to deal with that thought in our hearts and minds and deal with the reality of things and don't take these things personally and I mean, it's just, there's just some, some, there's some strategies that the Scripture lays out about that. And then we dealt with anger. And, of course, who doesn't get angry at times? And, you know, how you deal with it, what you do with it, where it goes, how you respond to it. I mean, you're going to get angry. The issue is how do you handle that anger? And we looked at the anger iceberg, you know, and just all of the things that can cause it and so forth. And then we looked last week at disappointment and Disappointment is a common emotion that we all face because we're all, we've all been disappointed in life. Things let us down. People let us down. Life lets us down. Things we counted on let us down. We get disappointed in life. And disappointment can really turn you upside down and leave you stranded. And you can just wallow in disappointment and uh, basically uh, create uh, uh, resentment, you know, as, as disappointment stews and disappointment festers in our life. It builds a pessimism and a resentment that can take over our lives, and we can actually become someone that we really don't want to be simply because we didn't handle disappointment just exactly right, and the Lord tells us how to deal with disappointment. Well, today, I, I want us to go, we're going to go in the book of Acts, and, and I know uh, many of you that have been with the Lord a long time, and you've studied your word, and you've been in church, you've been in Sunday school, you've been in Bible studies. The book of Acts is just a tremendous book. Uh, very descriptive, very real, very narrative in its structure. And it, uh, of course, written by Dr. Luke. And, um, uh, and, and he was traveling with the Apostle Paul uh, uh, much of the time. And a lot of things that happened in the book of, Life, uh, book of Acts, especially toward the end of the book of Acts, is talking about the Apostle Paul, as Wesley mentioned, in the book of Romans and in the book of Philippians, the book of Timothy. I mean, uh, about a third of the New Testament, the Apostle Paul writes, you know this, these are letters to churches that he's established and functioning in or people that he's pastoring and mentoring and shepherding in their life. And these are tremendous books of theology and how to look at life and how to deal with real life from somebody that's really dealing with real life. And in the book of Acts in chapter 27, there's a an account uh, that actually begins, it, it's, a, it, it's, the, it's the own flow of a story that goes really throughout the latter part of the book of Acts where the Apostle Paul uh, has felt from the Lord specifically that he was going to go to Rome. And of course, I'm sure Paul had an idea in his mind about how that trip to Rome was going to be. I'm sure he had uh, visions of grandeur, maybe, about preaching in the Colosseum and thousands and thousands of people be there like a Billy Graham crusade or something. And, and he would preach the word and then people would come forward and be saved and their lives would be affected and Rome would be shaken as a city by the, by the evangelism and the, and, the, and the spirit of the Holy Spirit of God as he blew through the Colosseum and the people. But, but that's not exactly how it happened. <laughs> I mean, it, it's just a little different the way God arranged him to go to Rome. And in Acts 27, the, the book starts in the first, I mean, the chapter starts first, 
first uh, seven or eight verses talk about the fact that the Roman government has decided that Paul's a subversive and has to be brought to Rome. And so they have him arrested and he's uh, imprisoned and, and, he's, and he's attached to uh, a, a fellow by the name of Julius of the, of the Augustine Guard. Uh, he's a centurion. He, he, he leads a hundred soldiers. So he's pretty significant in his rank, and he's given charge to bring Paul from, from Asia where he is, I mean, around the coast and through the Mediterranean up to Rome, Italy. And, and uh, it's a particular time of year, and uh, travel on the Mediterranean, and remember these days they only had, for, for the most part, small ships, uh, in, in comparison with today, for sure, small ships. And they were sail-driven. Obviously, there were no motors and there, were no, you know, there was no functioning other than to throw up a sail and let the wind carry you. And, uh, and so they got on a small ship because there was no Roman ship available. They got on a small ship and they, they sailed around the tips of things and the wind was a little contrary. And, and, and over a number of days, they, they, they finally pecked their way uh, to, a, to a place where they ran into a big giant grain ship a Roman a, 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 a ship of Alexandria that had grain on it that was going to Italy. And so they said, all right, we'll put Paul and these prisoners on this grain ship, and this grain ship's going to Italy, and it's a pretty big ship, and it's, you know, it's, it's used to traveling, and so uh, we'll put them on there, and they can take them on up there to Italy, and then he can be tried and put in prison or whatever they're going to do to him up there. And so as they put him on the, the, grain, the big grain ship, uh, they're in a little place that's called Fair Havens. By the way, the name Fair Havens was the name of, uh, of our homeschool when we were homeschooling our children and uh, four or five others that were their age. When, uh, all the way from junior high through high school, we, Tanya and I did that. And uh, she was the teacher and I was the principal. And um, <laughs> yeah, I got to put the Board of Education on the seat of higher understanding. Yeah. Um, and, and, and they didn't miss much on it. And, um, but, we, but that was the name of our school, Fair Havens. And it came from this passage because it's just a beautiful little name, you know. Fair Havens, that just sounds so nice, doesn't it? It sounds like a great place to be. Fair Havens. You know, if you're in a storm of life right now, and I'm sure some of you are, uh, if you're in a storm, the, the term Fair Havens would be kind of a poetically uh, pleasing sound to you, right? Boy, that's what I need. I need some Fair Havens. Well, Fair Havens was a place that, that they stopped. And, um, and because Fair Havens was not big enough to actually s supply the people with lodging and, and provisions and so forth, it really wasn't the kind of place that you would spend the whole winter. Because if you went past a certain time of year, the Mediterranean became perilous for sailing vessels. The wind blew contrary to the way you wanted to go. And um, uh, storms were common on the Mediterranean during the fall uh, months of the year. And so if you didn't get out of there by a certain time, uh, you were going to be trapped there all winter. Yeah. And so uh, there was a press, there was a press to get out and to go and, to, you know, and even though it might be a little sketchy and a little, little speculative, you know, let's, we got to go. And so the, the owners of the ship and the captain of the ship and the people in the ship and the grain business and all of that, the mercantile business, they said, man, we got to go. And so they kind of began to press to go. And, and you know, everything seemed to be fairly decent. And, and, and they set out. And when they set out, um, they are going to encounter uh, a tremendous storm. In life, and this storm is going to shipwreck them. And in the story of this storm, and in the buildup of how how we decide to to do things and how we respond to the to the storms of life, uh, it, I think it's a great story. It's a great parallel to the lives to the storms that we face in life, and the crises that we face in life. And I believe one of the reasons why the Lord places accounts like this in his word. Now, every bit of his word is true. And I believe every word, I, I'm not saying that he makes up stories to put in there. Every one of these are true. 
But, but there are so many things that could have been placed there. Uh, John, the, the, writer, the gospel writer John said, I suppose if all of the miracles that Jesus did were recorded in the book, that the world could not contain the volumes that could be written. So there are so many things that God could have written, and he chose this as, an, as one thing to be written here so that we could, we could learn from this. And I think this is, uh, these, this is the way the Lord teaches us in his word, and he shows us in his word that, that like, like this effort to get Paul to Rome and all of this uh, uh, hurry and all of this pressing and all of this, uh, you know, all of, the, all of the decisions that had to be made and all of the things that had to be done, uh, it, it, like our life. Our, our lives get like this. And, we, and we're pressed into things that we feel almost forced to hurry up and let's make a decision. Let's do this thing. Let's, I mean, I, I know it's a little tough. I know, well, you know, maybe it's not the best thing, but it's, we got to do this. And, and, then, and then we find ourselves uh, in storms of life. The Bible, Bible indicates to us that there are basically three reasons that storm come into our life. First of all, those we bring on ourselves. Now, this is the, these are things like, uh, like Samson, as an example, in the Bible. Samson, you know, was a Nazarite. You know what a Nazarite is, right? A Nazarite is a person who has dedicated himself to the Lord, and he's taken a vow, and that vow included not cutting his hair, not ever cutting his hair. That's the most famous part of that vow. But the other part of the vow was you can't drink any wine either. Can't even eat anything that contains a grape in it. If it was made by grapes or if it was raisins or whatever it was, you can't touch it if you're a Nazarite. And then the third thing was, you can't touch a dead body. You got to stay away from dead stuff. But now, Samson, of course, you know, the playboy of the Bible, had to, you know, test this thing. And he was a Nazarite, and he was uh, fully empowered by God, led by the Spirit. I mean, strong, powerful, strongest man possibly that's ever lived on the earth, you know, most likely the strongest man. I mean, he took donkey jawbones and killed people with it. You know, just, I mean, he just took a line and split him right down the middle, you know, and just, uh, oh, he was wild. And he couldn't stay away from Delilah. You know this, right? Yeah, and he, so he got his hair cut at, Delilah, at Delilah's barbershop and uh, snip, snip. And when he did, uh, all of his power left him and he brought that storm on himself. He ended up, he ended up in the Colosseum being made sport of, being led about by a little boy with his eyes poked out. And the little boy was leading him around because he was blind. And, 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 he, and he feels some pillars of the Colosseum and he hears the big crowd and he just prays and himself. He said, Lord, just one more time, God, one more time. Just give me, give, give me the strength one more time. And, and, and God gave him the strength and he pushed the pillars down and the Colosseum fell and the people, you know. I mean, this was Samson, but he brought that on himself. I mean, he's the one that went in the barbershop door, right? And then Israel as a nation. There's another good example. Israel as a nation. How many times have you read the scripture very much and you found out that it seems like over and over and over again, Israel is in bondage and captivity? I mean, does it seem strange to you that this would happen to them over and over and over? Not only in Egypt when Moses brings them out, but 13 times, 13 times, in the Old Testament, Israel followed the same pattern. God would bless them. They would be delivered. They would be prosperous and healthy and everything. And then they would begin to get cocky and proud and arrogant. And they would begin to say, mine arm has delivered me. And, and then, of course, they began to go down. And God would allow them to be taken captive by some weaker power, some weaker country. And they'd stay in country. And then whenever they got in bondage, they'd just cry, beg God, oh, God, please. Be God. And they'd beg God, beg God, and repent and sorrowful. And, blah, blah, blah. and God, would, God would, would, would have compassion on them and deliver them. And then they would get cocky. And then they would go down 13 times in the Bible. I know you're sitting there going, man, those people never learn. Thirteen times, I believe I would have learned a lesson. Well, you know, I'm just saying, look around, man. I mean, you know, I mean, it's been thousands of years. Nothing's really changed a lot, right? So there are a lot of times that we take ourselves into storms, and then there are those that God sends, and this is what people like Job, you know, and 
Job didn't know what was happening, and God had a, a confrontation with the devil, and it was God who looked at the devil and said, have you considered my servant Job? And so God flung down the gauntlet, and, fl- and, and God said, all right, well, let's just have a battle between me and you, and we'll make Job's life be the battlefield. And uh, all kinds of terrible things. He loses his family, loses his wealth, loses his everything. The only thing, the only thing he's left with is a, is a nagging wife with bad advice. Um, curse God. And ladies, I'm not trying to insult you. You know I like you better than men anyway. But, 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 but that's what happened. I mean, it, it, he's sitting on the garbage dump, and she, says, uh, she comes out there and she says, Why do you, in- why do you maintain your integrity? Curse God and go ahead and die. That's bad advice now. And, uh, of course, that's when Job said, well, should we expect good from God only and not bad? When things bad happen, should we leave God? Great book. But that was a storm that was caused simply by God challenging somebody's life. But by far the worst storms in life are those that are caused by others. And these are the storms like we're going to look at today where Someone else has made a poor choice, and their poor choice has somehow involved you, and now you have been pulled into uh, a storm. And, and, and we see here in Acts 27 that Paul is on a ship to Rome, and, and he tried to stop them. I mean, when they said, let's go, the, the wind's blowing right, everything's good, uh, let's go. Paul tried to stop them. Verse 9 and 10, this is Paul speaking to them. Now, when much time had been spent and sailing was now dangerous because the fast was already over. The fast they're talking about there is the Day of Atonement, the Jewish feast day of atonement, which happens in no, September, November. So we're deep into the fall. It had already passed. It's getting dangerous. It's a dangerous time to try to get out there on the Mediterranean. You're rolling the dice is basically all you're doing. And Paul advised them, saying, Men, I perceive that this voyage will end it with disaster and much loss, not only of the cargo and ship, but also our lives. So the Apostle Paul says, All right, guys, let's don't, you know, let's think about what we're doing. And, and, and I'm going to advise you not to do this. And of course, like us, I know many of you feel the same way. Man, if people would just listen to what I say, the world would be a lot better place, right? I mean, of course, we all feel this way. Like, our advice is wonderful. Well, the Apostle Paul says, all right, guys, I'm going to tell you, if you do this, it's going to be terrible. Uh, but they didn't listen to Paul. And now Paul will find himself in a storm on a ship that he didn't make for himself, and he did everything he could to try to, uh, to try to stop before it happened. And so like you, maybe like you, your life is rocking and rolling right now. And waves are coming, and the wind's blowing, and you're being shook everywhere, and you're, and you're getting sick. I mean, you know, it's just a tough life, but it's, it, it's caused because somebody else made a poor choice. So why do we experience storms in life? Well, Verse 11, the very next verse says, Nevertheless, the centurion was more persuaded by the helmsman and the owner of the ship than by the things which were spoken by Paul. Now, it is amazing, once again, that 2,000 years have passed and we still have the, the same situations in life. Why do these storms come in life? Well, number one, because we listen to the wrong experts. The helmsman and the owner of the ship said, well, you know, I think that it'll be okay for us to get out there. I mean, I've been around the shipping business a long time, and it just looks like conditions are good. And, this, you know, this has been a good year, and I think things are going to be calm out there. Let's just look. The ship's sturdy. The ship's able. Let's just get out there. And go. Paul says, no, it's going to end in a disaster. But... Instead of listening to the Apostle Paul, they listen to the experts. Now, we have a world full of experts today. Uh, everybody's an expert today, right? <laughs> right? And if you listen to them, you'll still be making mistakes today. Yeah, we have experts in science. We got fake science. We got fake climatologists. We got fake preachers. We got fake historians. We got fake... I mean, everything, and if you listen to them, you're going to get the wrong answer every time. So why do we face storms and lie? Well, we listen to the wrong experts. Look at verse 12. And because the harbor was not suitable to winter in, 
In other words, it's not big enough. There are not enough motel rooms. There are not enough restaurants to feed the crew and all that all winter. So it was not suitable to winter in. The majority advised to set sail from there also if by any means they could reach Phoenix. Uh, when I saw that, I thought, by the time I get to Phoenix, and only you old people that like Glenn Campbell will know what I'm talking about there, but if by means they might reach Phoenix, a harbor of Crete, opening toward the southwest and northwest and winter there. But the, what I want you to see is, who did they listen to? And because the harbor was not suitable to winter in, the majority advised us, all right, let's go, guys. I don't know if they took a vote. I don't know if they had a union meeting or what. But the majority of people on that boat said, we're going to go. So why do we get in trouble? We listen to popular opinion. Popular opinion is almost always wrong. I don't know if you guys are aware of that. Uh, most of the time, if you take popular opinion and you do just the opposite, you're going to be honoring God in whatever you do. One of the most, uh, one of the most memorable uh, popular opinion failures was Katie Spardia. When Moses sent the spies over, you remember to look at the land, and he sent 12 spies. And they went over into the promised land, and they brought back the report, and what did they say? They said they brought back, they had like uh, bananas on a big stick and grapes on a big stick between two of them that were so big and plentiful, and they brought it back, and they, and they, and they, and, 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 and they told Moses, we got the report, and so Moses steals the crowd. All right, guys, listen, you guys got a report. All right, here's the promised land. We've been talking about it. We've got, all right, listen, get down, get quiet. All right, uh, tell us what it is. And, and then they started their report. The minority started first. Uh, I mean, excuse me, the majority started first, 10 of them. 10 of them said, man, I'm gonna tell you what. God did not lie to us. Whoo, that land is flowing with milk and honey. That thing is unbelievable. And we just brought back a bunch of these grapes and bananas and stuff. We just brought back some of this stuff just to show you how plentiful and bountiful this land is. Uh, but there's one thing that God did not tell us. Uh, I hate to break it to you, but this land is occupied. <laughs> yeah. yeah I, mean, I mean, there's some people already living there. This thing's occupied. And he said, and they said, and by the way, the, these people, it's occupied with people that are so big that we look like grasshoppers in their sight, which I don't know how they thought they looked in somebody else's sight. That's probably how they felt about themselves. You know, we look like a grasshopper compared to him. And so, and so we make a motion, Mr. Moderator. And our motion is that we uh, don't go over there into that land with all those big people and stuff like that. And then there were many seconds, many amens. Hey, hey, hey. And then Joshua stood up. And Joshua said, well, folks, look. I can't say, I mean, this is what, what they said is right, but all I'm going to say to you is if, if God is for us, who can be against us? If this is the land God wants us to have, they're going to be nothing but, but, but bread in our mouth. But the people listened to the majority and decided we're not going into the land, and so God said, all right, we'll just make you another lap around Mount Sinai. And they lapped and lapped and lapped until every one of them that was 21 years or older died. The only person that was 21 years or older when they made that decision that got to go into the promised land was Joshua. Because he said, let's do it. God's for us. Everybody else died. God just marched them around out there in the desert until they all finally died and then brought them back up to the land, brought their children back up to the line and said, all right, now what will you do? So we get in storms because we listen to the wrong experts. We get in storms because we listen to popular opinion. Popular opinion, you know what the favorite motto of popular opinion is? Well, everybody's doing it. Well, no, not every, the only thing everybody's doing is breathing, as far as I, as I know. But that's the popular opinion, and it'll lead you wrong. It'll mess you up every time. Now, verse 13, when the south wind blew softly. Isn't that a beautiful phrase? I mean, you can see that. You can feel that, right? When the south wind... Whew, not a nor'easter, not the, not the nasty north. I mean, all you northerners, I'm sorry, but, but not the, <laughs> I'm meddling now. I'm just, but, but, but this is a south wind. This is the, 
the, the, the trouble on the Mediterranean came from the Northeast, just like a Nor'easter like you hear now on the East Coast of, of America, same thing in the Mediterranean. That Nor'easter was a storm that blew out of the Northeast, man, like a cyclone. You know, we have, we have uh, hurricanes over here. They have cyclones and they have, uh, what else? Uh, different, it spins in different directions, but same thing. That typhoons, yeah, and, and, and they blow in, and that, that's, what, that's what happens on the Mediterranean in the, in, in, the month, in the fall months, in the winter months. And so the south wind is blowing softly. Oh, whew. man, what a refreshing, what a refreshing thing. Supposing that we had obtained, uh, supposing that they had obtained their desire, putting out to sea, they sailed close to Crete. So uh, when the south wind began to blow softly, they thought, okay, we have our answer. This is a sign from God. God says, go ahead, because uh, they followed their feelings. So why do we get in storms? Well, we listen to wrong experts. We, uh, we regard popular opinion. Uh, we follow our feelings, and, and feelings will get you in trouble a lot. A lot of times, there was a song in the 70s, and I, only you old people will remember this, but in the 70s, there was a song by Debbie Boone. You remember this song? It was a song, You Light Up My Life. How many of you remember? You, you know, you light up my life. Anyway, uh, there was a line in that song. You're, there was a line in that song that I thought about when I thought about this thing of our feelings. And the line was, how could this be wrong when it feels so right? You want me to tell you how? Feelings lie. That's how. And they'll get you in a mess every time. And so, because they followed their feelings, uh, they, they followed their feelings right on into some crisis here and some chaos. Look at verse 14. But not, all right, they, the south wind blew. They got out in the water. They were going to sail by Crete, kind of get by the island and just get down. But not long after, a tempestuous headwind arose called Eurachlidon. How many of you have ever heard of Eurachlidon? You've heard that word? That's the name of, I mean, it's a type of storm. It's a nor'easter. It's a typhoon uh, in the Mediterranean, and it's called Eurachlidon. It has another name now, but in the biblical days, it was called Eurachlidon. It just means a bad, strong northeast wind, that, uh, blowing eel, you know, and terrible, and, and, and it's going to be a bad problem for them. So not long after they set out, they, they followed their feelings right on into a, a terrible catastrophe of life, and, and, and so the wind blew, and so... This is why we experience storms in life because we just we, we make bad choices, we listen to bad advice, we we do things that are this popular that are, that we feel like, and, and 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 it just leads us into these crises, these storms in life that'll just blow up. You know, if everything worked right, it would be one. You know, we could probably get by with it. If everything did perfectly, I mean, we would that would be okay. That would we skate by. But the trouble is. 99.99.99.99% of the time, things don't work right, do they? And so this is why we experience, so the story not only tells us why we experience storms in life, it, 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 it tells us how they affect our lives. Let's look at just what happens to us in storms. Storms cause us to drift. Now, these are the same thing, by the way, the same thing that happened to these sailors in this story are the same things that happened to us in life. When we have storms in our life, we do the same three things they did. It's amazing how, how similar they are. Uh, storms cause us to drift. Now, let me show you verse 15, 16, 17. So when the ship was caught and could not head into the wind, we let her drive. I don't know what kind of uh, technical Navy term that is. But let her drive, I just kind of get the idea that they're just uh, hoping that she pushes on through with the wind. I mean, it's left up to the ship. I mean, we, we just, we, we, the wind's contrary, we just let her go. And running under the shelter of an island called Clauda, we secured the skiff with difficulty. All right, we got the little skiff, you know, like, but, and, and it was tough to hold on to. And verse 17, when they had taken it on board, they used cables to undergird the ship and fearing lest they should run aground on the, on the sear to sands. These were like 
uh, little sandy uh, sandbars that were close to a shoreline, and they extended out like about seven or eight miles. I mean, they were treacherous, treacherous things. It would be really deep, in one, and then all of a sudden it'd be like 10 feet deep, and, and, and you know, the ship would be moving, and then all of a sudden it would hit one of these uh, sandbars, and, and it would just get caught. It would stop it right there. So they were afraid of that. They were near to all of that. They struck sail. You know what struck sail means? They dropped their sails. In other words, when they got to this point where it was just so devastating and it was just beyond any of their control and they couldn't do a thing and the winds were contrary and the waves were contrary and it was blasting them and rocking and rolling and sailing and they couldn't have sea and it was blowing and, and, and they just, what they did is they just, they just dropped the sail and let go of the, let go of the, uh, of the rudder and said, God bless us, you know. I hope I, 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 I hope we can make it through. Yeah, I mean, come on, man. I mean, ain't nothing we can do. Let's just, let's just let her drift. And so back in the days, in these days, they didn't have modern compasses like we have. So they had to depend on the stars and the sun and the moon and so forth for navigation. However, one of the problems that they had here, according to some of the verses that follow, is... Uh, the sun and the moon didn't shine for 14 days. 14 days now. That's, in other words, they are in black darkness, sun, uh, daylight, and dark for 14 days. They, they could see no stars. They could see no sun. They could see no moon. All right, so if you're depending on the sun, the moon, and the stars to, to, to navigate for you, and you haven't seen them in 14 days, um, what, what's going to happen to you? <laughs> You're going to drift, right? I mean, the, the waves, look, the waves are going to beat you this way. How, how many of you have ever been out on like a little rubber raft or a little, uh, a little layout floaty kind of deal? And you've been out in, a, in, in some water where there's some waves and stuff that happen. How many, I mean, you know, you're just floating along there and then all of a sudden, bam, you know, and the thing turns you over or something like that. And then the next it hits you here and you, you suck water in, you can't breathe. <laughs> You know, I mean, have you ever been in that kind of condition? Well, that's the kind of condition they were in. Well, if you ever do get there, Bev, that's what's going to happen to you. <laughs> so don't do it. You don't, you don't like it. So anyway, they, there's no way to control their destination. There's no way to, to handle where they're going. Strong emotions are, 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 you know, are pushing them. I mean, uh, 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 hopelessness, helplessness, uh, fear, anxiety. Pre I mean, you know, basically they've come to the conclusion, why fight it? I mean, you know, if God doesn't save us, we're dead. So, so storms cause us to drift. And when you get in a crisis, if you're not careful, you'll drift You'll start drifting because it's almost like, why fight it? I mean, it's too big for me. And I, all right, second thing, storms cause us to discard. In other words, storms cause us to throw stuff away. We get real impulsive when we get in a storm. You know, we get, it's like we begin to, we kind of begin to panic is what really begins to happen. And we just start looking around for stuff to get rid of in our life. Uh, let me show you what they did. And because they were exceedingly tempest-tossed, the next day they lightened the ship. That means they started throwing stuff overboard. On the third day, we threw the ship's tackle overboard with our own hands. Now, let me tell you what, what, what was happening here. What was happening was they were being tossed and torn and shaken, and the sail was down. They didn't know where they were. They didn't know where they were going. They didn't know what was going to happen to them. They had absolutely no control over anything, and so what they what happened to them is they started getting desperate, and when they started getting desperate, they started throwing stuff overboard, and the first thing they threw was the cargo. They started throwing the wheat. You see, this was a big wheat ship going to Italy. They started throwing that out because they needed the ship to sit higher, and all that weight in it was making it sit too low, and they were trying to lighten it and make the ship come on up on the water some, and, and so they started throwing the cargo out, and then when they got through throwing the cargo out, that wasn't enough, and they threw the tackle off the ship. That means... That means the ropes and the, and the cables and the, and the pulleys and everything that it took to guide the ship. They threw it overboard. And then fi the final thing they threw were, was their food. They threw their food overboard. And they're out there and they're just throwing stuff. And, and look, 
when you get in, under pressure, you get impulsive and you start looking for things to eliminate in our lives. I mean, just, you know, you know, get it out and throw it away. The tough things about the tough thing about the things that we choose to throw away are usually the things that we're going to need if life gets better. You know? I mean, if the storm stops and the ship comes under control, they've thrown the tackle overboard. They're not going to be able to guide it regardless of what happens. And, and so we throw stuff uh, 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 overboard that we need in, in, in better days. And, and is, that, is that typical of people when they get in a crisis and a storm to just start eliminating stuff? Just start throwing stuff away and panicking and, you know, disregard. Well, I thought about it. I said, you know, that is so much like people nowadays. And, and, and I thought about one specific instance. I can't tell you how many times I've had people that I've counseled with or people that have come to church, been involved in everything, and doing great. I mean, their life's moving forward. They're doing better. Uh, their families are doing better. Their homes are businesses. I mean, they, they're finally getting a little stability in life and so forth. And then all of a sudden, a storm blows in. And the first thing they quit doing is what? Coming to church. So it's like, all right, the first thing I'm going to discard out of my life is I'm going to get rid of church. I don't have to go. To, <laughs> those people down there, they're probably judging me. But storms cause us to discard. It causes us to drift and then cause us to discard. And then here's the third thing, cause us to despair. Now, despair means to lose hope is what despair means. If you hear the word, you hear the phrase, I was in despair, it meant I have lost all hope in life. And notice verse 20 here. Now, when neither the sun nor the stars appeared for many days, verse 27 tells you it was actually 14. And no small tempest beat upon us all hope that we would be saved, was finally given up. So the last thing to go in a storm is hope. But when hope goes, everything goes. When you lose hope, you are in serious trouble. So here they are, out in the Mediterranean, 14 days, tossed to and fro, back and forth, Storm, storm is blowing. They've thrown everything overboard. And now the last thing that goes is hope. And their attitude is uh, we're doomed. We're, 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 we're not going to make it. Uh, this, this isn't going to happen. Uh, I thought it was going to work. I, I, I wanted it to work. I pray it'll work. But it ain't going to work. And, and so we just need to you know, fold our arms and talk to God and go on out of here, you know. But now, the one thing they forgot that I'd like for you to remember is God rides on hopelessness. God thrives in hopeless situations. If God be for us, uh, Romans says, who can be against us? <laughs> I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So when the situations get hopeless, that's when God begins to work and do action. And the amazing part of this story is uh, how calm and what the Apostle Paul says to them after all hope is gone. In other words, Paul gives them some guidelines about what to do when the storms in life and the crises in life have turned your world upside down. You've drifted to heaven knows where. You've thrown away everything in life that's of any value to you. You have no direction. You have no goal. You have no values. You, you've lost. You've given up on everything. And so what do you do when these storms in life wreck your life? Well, the Apostle Paul says, here, we're going to do three things. Let me show you first. This is verse 29. This is kind of toward the end of the, a little bit of the end of the story, but, but it tells you what, he, what, he, what, he, what his advice was. Then, fearing lest we should run aground on the rocks, okay, they've gotten to a place where they're, they're afraid that they've, they're going to miss the channel and, and the rocks and the, and the, and the sands are going to kill them and destroy them and, and cause the ship to break apart and fall apart and all that. So he said, so when fearing that we would run aground on the rocks, notice what they did. They dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for day, pray for the day to come. So 
the advice of, of the story and the advice of the Apostle Paul is the safest thing that we can do when we're in a storm and we're about to be battered on the rocks and, 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 and stuck in the sandbars and, and, we're, and our ships are going to be destroyed, the safest thing that we can do is drop anchor. Drop some anchors. Now, this is the exact opposite of what we feel like we need to do. What we feel like we need to do is we need to make some changes. That's what we feel like we need to do. We, need to, we feel like we need to start changing some things and making some other decisions as if, as if some more confusion in your life is what you need. No, it's the exact opposite of what you need. What you need in the storms of life is not more confusion and not being unsettled more and more and having a bunch of new stuff you're trying to pop into your life as if you need something else to shake you up and rattle you. What we need is we need to drop some anchors in our life. We need to get some stability in our life. And so the Apostle Paul says, Let's, we're going to drop some anchors. Verse 22, now I urge you to take heart. In other words, he, he looks at the guys and he says, uh, hey guys, be of good cheer. <laughs> Don't you love somebody like that in the middle of a crowd? Hey, guys, don't worry about it. Hey, listen to me, what I'm about to say. And now our, this is the Apostle Paul. Now, remember, all of that stuff is happening that we've been going through for about the past 30 minutes or so, for whatever. Been like. That's what's going on. And then the Apostle Paul stands up and he says, hey, guys, be of good cheer, man. I got a word for you. Uh, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. So he says, all right, we're not, God's not going to let any of us die. It, it's only the ship that's going, to be, that's, that's going to be lost. And then he says, uh, for there stood by me this night an angel of God to whom I belong and whom I serve. So the Apostle Paul says, all right, let me tell you, this is, this is why I know that we're going to be all right. Because an angel from God, one of God's messengers, came down and talked to me. And this angel assured me that it's going to be all right, that we're not going to die in this thing. And so the first anchor that you drop in a storm when you're all shook up, according to what Paul just said is, the first anchor in my life when I get in a crisis and I get all shook up and I think I'm going down with the ship and I'm battered and beaten and sick and ill and everything else is the, the presence of God. The first anchor that we Christians have to fight these tumultuous times in our life is that storms can't hide the face of God. No matter how severe the storm is, no matter how bad it is, no matter how tough it is, the, the lesson here is that God's face can still be seen. I mean, storms and anxiety and crisis uh, have a tendency to uh, hide God's face. I mean, we, we, have a, we, have a, we have a tendency to, to look around when things get tough and tight and we're anxious and we're, we're all out of shape and bent and, and tattered. We look around and we say, where's God? Because we can't see the face of God when we get in the middle of these crises of life. But I'm going to tell you where God is. God is the same place he's always been. You just can't see that. I, I was reminded this is another old reference. And I'm sorry, but I'm old, so I don't have any, I don't know anything about Power Rangers or whoever, whatever. And I, I don't know anything about all these modern people. I still owe. Well, what about Big Bird? <laughs> Cookie Monster. I, I mean, I don't know anything about this new, new stuff. But there was a movie that Tanya and I saw long, long ago. It's called The Count of Monte Cristo. Did any of you see that, by the way, Count of Monte Cristo? It was about, I mean, the Count was, well, the Count was banished into a, into a prison, and he was a spiritual person, and he believed in God, and he loved God. And as he was digging his, he was trying to tunnel his way out of this prison that he was in, and there was an old priest there, and he was digging, 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 and he was in the tunnel, and he was digging, and, and, and he got to the point where he got so frustrated and so full of anxiety that he looked around, and he said, he said, I don't know if I even believe in God anymore. And then the old priest said, well, that's all right, because he still believes in you. Now, 
What has God promised us? God has promised us, I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. God has promised us, uh, go and I'll be with you even until the ends of the age. God has said, uh, don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe, you believe in God, believe also in me. Uh, if I go and prepare a place, I'm coming back to receive you. He said, I'm, I, I'm not going to leave you comfortless in life. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. So the question is, is, is God true to his word? Can we believe God? Well, then when we get in the midst of a crisis and God says, I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to forsake you. You're not alone in this thing. I'm right here with you. Cast all your burdens on me for I care for you. Look for the face of God. God's right there with you. He hasn't left you. He hasn't forsaken you. Listen, how do we know the truth? We know the truth when God tells us the truth. What circumstances show us is not the truth. It's only true when God says it's true. I'll give you a perfect example. In your Bible, there's a story in the Gospel of Luke called the widow of Nain. You remember this? You remember that name? She was a widow in the little city of Nain, and there was this funeral service going on. She had already lost her husband, and she was a widow, and she had a funeral procession going down the street, and it was her son that was in the casket. And Jesus stopped the funeral procession and looked at her and said, Ma'am, what are you doing? And she said, Well, I'm having a funeral service for my son who's dead laying in that coffin right there. Now, I'm going to ask you, is that the truth? That woman said, My son is dead in that coffin right there. Is that the truth? No, it's not the truth because it's not the truth until Jesus says it's the truth. Jesus looked at her and said, Well, ma'am, uh, Hey, stop right there once. And he walked over to the casket and he put his hands and he said, Arise. And the boy sat up in the casket and was alive again. So, what's the truth? The truth is the boy wasn't dead, he's alive. Why? Because Jesus, it, it's not a truth until God says it's true. And so when you get in the storms of life and you can't see God's face and you're all worried and anxious and nervous about, this is never going to work and I'm going to come to an end. I'm being destroyed and I thought God would have And all of those things, just remember, God has promised you some things and it's not over until God gives you the truth about those things. So what anchor do I drop when I'm in a crisis? The anchor of the presence of God. That's the first one. Second one. When, he, when the angel spoke to Paul, he said, saying, do not be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar, and indeed, God has granted you all those who sail with you. Here's the second anchor, anchor you drop, the purpose of God. The purpose of God was Paul was going to Rome. That was the purpose of God. So is he going to die in a ship in the Mediterranean if the purpose of God is that Paul go to Rome? No matter how bad the storm looks, no matter how tough the times get, I mean, you may lose the tackle, you may lose the food, you may lose the boat, you may even get wet yourself, but you are not going to die if the purpose of God is that you go to Rome. And could I get you to believe that God has a purpose for your life? I know you look at me and you say, well, God, I know, Pastor, God has a purpose for you because you're a pastor, but could I convince you that God has a purpose for you? that is just as powerful and strong, that you are not an accident, that you were not born on this earth by accident, and that you were appointed by God a certain time and a place to be, and this is where God puts you because God has a purpose for you. And until God's purpose is accomplished in you, you are immortal. Could, what, could I get you to believe that? So when the storms of life come in and the tragedies of life and and, 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 the, and the strong winds of emotion, the anxieties, the loneliness, the, 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 the temptations, the bitterness, the strife, the hostility and all of that begins to just push you and blow you and batter you and throw you and turn you upside down and fill your lungs with water that you can say, I'm putting an anchor down because God has a purpose for me and until God is finished with me, I'm not going to die in this thing. So when the storms of life come, throw some anchors out. The presence of God. Storms can't hide the face of God. The purpose of God. Storms can't thwart God's purpose. And then the last one, therefore take heart. <laughs> Paul says, all right, 
The angel said, you're going to Rome and everybody's going with you. I'm not going to let any of the people on the boat die with you. Therefore, take heart, men, for I believe God that it will be just as it was told to me. So the third anchor is the promise of God. And the promise of God is that no matter how bad the storm is, it cannot destroy the child of God. God is our father. God is our protector. God is our provider. And nothing can destroy us that, that doesn't first go through God. Now, I'm telling you, you know, you say, boy, some terrible things have happened. And I'm just, whoo, I mean, it, I wish they wouldn't have happened. And it's been terrible. And I have a tough life. And, I, and just let me say to you one thing that everything that comes in your life has been filtered through God. Amen. Not one single thing can the enemy do to you that he doesn't get permission from your loving Heavenly Father to move into your life with. The devil does not have free reign. The devil does not, cannot do anything that he wants to do. If he did, he'd kill every one of us right now wipe us off the face of the earth. It is the blood of Jesus that stops the destroyer of our soul. And the anchor of God is whenever these things happen to us, remember that God has made you a promise and God keeps his promises. So some of you are going through a devastating storm and, and crisis right now and, and, and problems are just overwhelming and you think you're going down for, for the last time. But God says, hey, the boat may be lost, the cargo may be lost, uh, uh, some property may be lost, the tackle may be lost. Uh, you, you might be swimming for a little while, but hey, you're going to make it because of the promise of God. I used to say this. I used to say this quote. Uh, God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. Now I think a truer way to say that is God said it, and that settles it whether I believe it or not. So it doesn't matter about the storms. The, the only thing that can change God's purpose in your life is your choice. You, you can become, I started to say the Jesse James, but I, I know Jesse James is not the old outlaw Jesse James. Jesse James rides a motorcycle now or something, whatever. <laughs> right? Uh, if I said you became the Jesse James of your own life, I'd be talking about you're the old stagecoach robber Jesse James of your own life. You rob your own self because you're the only one that can do it because God says, hey, no, nothing can pass to you that doesn't pass through me. And, and, and just one last little verse. Uh, we say it, I say it all the time and I just want to remind you of it. When we're talking about, about hopelessness and, 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 and uh, despair and, and, and the storms and crisis of life, Hebrews 1, Hebrews 11, 1 says what? For now, faith is the substance, the substance. We used to think about that like a scientific, like a uh, chemical substance, right? But think of the word substance. Substance means to something to stand on, something that's under you that you can stand on. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The reason God brings you to church like this and has somebody get up here and just scream and yell at you and holler and stomp and spit and everything else is like he's some kind of madman is because God wants your faith to be strengthened. The word of God strengthens your faith. You look at this and you say, if God could do it for Paul, he can do it for me. If Paul can live through this, I can live through this. If all of the word of God says that I have nothing to fear because God is with me and God's promises are true and, God, and nothing can stop the, the purpose of God, then I can believe that. And when I believe that, my hope has something to stand on. So hope does not go away. And that's what church is good for. You, you wonder, you say, why did I come to church? Well, there you go. That's what church is good for right there. So if you need something for your hope to stand on so you don't lose hope, then you better be at church because that's what's going to do it for you. Because that's what the word, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the, by the daily soap opera, uh, by the farmer's magazine, uh, what, what uh, by the latest music track, video game, Fortnite, give you, the, give you hope. No, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And it's the word of God that speaks and gives our faith, our hope something to stand on. So anyway, uh, praise the Lord. Won't you stand your feet? Yeah.